there's any one question I get asked, like by far the most, it's definitely, how'd you get into all this, you know? <laughs> so, finally, I'm ready to answer that fucking question. Do it, Steve-O. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, <laughs> Does uh, everybody get this idea that like somebody just gives you an opportunity, like, oh, how do all the jackass stuff start? You know, like, exactly. And it's like, well, I don't know, man. Go back ten years. That's, that's exactly the shit I was doing. So here it is, the early years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how it all began. See ya. <laughs> Trace the steps of how it all began. Did they record? In the very beginning, like uh, when I was dropping out of the University of Miami, like I didn't really have a concept of the real world. Yeah, that was cool. Great. Can you see good? Like the blood in my eye. I didn't know what was going on. So, um, like it occurred to me, like, holy shit, I'm not gonna make it in life. <laughs> you know, I, re I really didn't expect to ever have any any kind of success at all. Like the video camera really became like Please, really important. Like. I considered all the footage like a message in the bottle, you know. I figured I would just completely fail in life and totally like. Yeah. Right. How's it going, Dad? Pretty good. I'll get back here pretty often. Not really. <laughs> oh, man, for crying out loud. Are you talking about? To Florida in general. Like... Florida in general, yeah. Visiting family in Florida twice a year. Three times a year. Yeah. It's, uh, it's okay for me to have steal some hot dogs? Uh, is this is this dinner? I mean, are you gonna take it with you and cook it in the hotel? Uh, <laughs> I got the same as my dad, except just with diamonds all over it. Yeah, he's got the Liberace variation. <laughs> my dad's had his Rolex for, since 1978. Yeah, I've had mine for 25 years. And last night at dinner, I said that if Steve's able to keep his for 25 years. That'll be quite an accomplishment. Yeah, everyone's been making bets on how long I'll be able to keep it, and I think they're all in like weekly increments. <laughs> I spent most of my working career with American multinationals uh, uh, working and eventually running offshore subsidiaries, and it's kind of normal to move every two or three years. But in our case, it was changing countries rather than changing cities. The family historian, my sister Cindy. Check it out, she's, she's got all kinds of crap. <laughs> Steve was born in England to an American father and a Canadian mother. Ah, three passports. That is one of the first pictures we've got of Steve. Look at those googly eyes. <laughs> I was a butt nut even when I was a baby. <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh, that was the um, tooth that you lost entirely too soon, but you would have been um, not quite a year and a half. This is my first try at walking. You slipped on a stair and smacked your tooth. <laughs> it was something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you the boozer at age two. <laughs> Sticking bread sticks up your nose and grabbing uh, somebody's beverage. Just slugging down the booze. I was an action hero. Yeah. I don't know if you can see my bib on. That's not the greatest picture. This so is my first Canadian passport. Look how old I am. And I'm all over the place. Globe trotting like James Bond, like when I was a baby. American passport, British passport, and Canadian passport. I have to get extra pages. I'm globe trotting so hard right now. <laughs> That's a pretty cool one. Getting stunty. You were fearless. Huh. You were pretty excited about machetes in Africa. Oh, yeah, I was an action hero. There he is in his super cool name shirt, <laughs> wielding a machete. That started it all right there. <laughs> the Rambrand. Yeah. 
Yeah. Dear Stephen, please spend more time preparing your essays and reading assignments. You can do A work. B plus. <laughs> Steve made underachieving an art form. So the point where I became totally dangerous, I figured out I could do anything I wanted as long as I wanted to bad enough, was on October 25th, 1987, when Motley Crue came to Toronto on Girls, Girls, Girls Tour. I figured out the name of their manager, and I called every single hotel in the Yellow Pages asking for Doc McGee's room. So I was 13 years old when I met Nikki Six and Tommy Lee. Tommy, dude, we might not get enough chance. Yeah, dude, come on. <laughs> Good to see you. Dude. Yeah, dude, finally, man. Yeah. I haven't seen you since 1987. <laughs> yeah. I still can't believe that at that age, you were so fucking determined to find this band that made you crazy at this point <laughs> and found us, like, by calling every fucking hotel. You the... could argue that you made me crazy. <laughs> that, that rules. I wrote that testimonial for your book, and, like, I said how, like, you weren't my hero because you were a great drummer. You were my hero because you behaved so horribly bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to high school at the American School in London, England, all four years of high school. Well, when I was 15 years old, I, my dad won a video camera in a golf tournament. So he just kind of stuffed it in his closet. As soon as I took that camera away from my dad, like we were off to the races making skateboard videos all over London, England. And by the time he noticed it was missing, I had already made like home edited, you know, like skate videos. And I just showed them to my dad and he was super psyched. <laughs> actually glad I stole the camera, I think, because, you know, the seldom times when I ever showed any actual initiative to, you know, be motivated on my own. When Steve puts his mind to something, to do something, he can do anything that he wants to do. Uh, the problem is that that's a fairly narrow slice of the pie. <laughs> <laughs> so it starts off, it's not that terribly good quality. My, my way of editing was to record. I mean, my way of editing for years, you know, like all the way up to like when Jackass started, like I was editing back and forth on VCRs. I don't know, yeah, if, if, if I thought a trick was extra cool, you know, I would like hit pause and <laughs> go, so they get a freeze frame or whatever, you know. <laughs> The first video is called I Hate Rain. I Hate Rain. Yeah, I Hate Rain, that's what it's called. I was in 10th grade when I made it, and the day, the day that I called it finished, I brought it into school, and my chemistry teacher, like we walked into class, my chemistry teacher screened my skate video from the class, and then everybody got to go home. Or not go home, but like, you know, nobody were let out of class. And then when my second video came out, I Hate Pebbles, you know, it's a skateboarder's nightmare when you're rolling along, and, Pebble like wedges in there like a doorstop, you just go flying. Every time I see a pebble, uh huh, it makes me fall. It goes into my wheel. I know, man. And then I fall. Man, if I ever see a pebble again, I don't know what I'm gonna do, man. <laughs> Double fall. After we finished one of our videos, we didn't want it to just end. You know, we wanted to pour a little personality on top. So we'd write these cool songs. Oh, 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 oh Maggie, you know it, baby. It's embarrassing. <laughs> just play the song. I am completely crazy. You know it, baby. Baby, baby, oh, 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 baby. When I graduated high school, I didn't take any time off. I came straight here <laughs> to University of Miami. Yeah, I do have a lot of history here. I'll never forget when we uh, first visited the Miami campus. 
he said, uh, I don't want to go to this, this place. I will go to this place. And uh, he cranked out his uh, entrance essay in no time flat. And uh, you know, for just that brief spurt, we had a very highly motivated academic. But it kind of it kind of fizzled out when he got there. Fizzled out when he got there. So when I was 18 years old, I came here to the University of Miami, and within two weeks of class starting my freshman year, I got kicked out of this building. They relocated me over to the 12-story building over there, and I got thrown out of that one for smashing a window out and climbing out onto that roof and climbing all the way up that radio tower. Like I climbed down, and there were all these cops on the roof. And they fucking threw me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Swimming in Lake Prohibited. The day that I showed up for my first year of college was the same day as Hurricane Andrew. <laughs> and that night, while Hurricane Andrew was going on, I swam across this lake. <laughs> Apparently, that's like one of the biggest rules of this campus, is like you're not allowed to swim across the lake. <laughs> I swam across that lake during Hurricane Andrew. I was homeless for a long time. And I kind of had too much pride to, you know, ask for, like, my parents to help me out. And, like, they weren't really going to, like, pay me to be a bag of shit. Once I dropped out of college, I was genuinely on my own. I'd break into the cafeterias for all my food, sleep on all my friends' floors, you know, like, I had a maid. I'd cruise around the video camera and vandalize the buildings and jump off of them. I should have a goddamn statue around here. Yeah, this was like my skate spot right here. I would just come out here and skate. I broke the board all hang off that. I skated this flat around here a lot. Like, I had a little carpet on the ground, and you know, I did kick my back seven, 180. See, you can recognize those stairs, huh? Yeah, it's right here. Nice. Like, I walked up them. Well, yeah, that's the Olympic pool over there. That's where, where I got my start. The University of Miami diving towers. Yeah, I'd come in the middle of the night and practice my, my jumps. Even students aren't allowed on the high dives. <laughs> I can't believe they make it so easy to get on this goddamn roof. Sometimes I used to, I used to spend quite a while up on these roofs. <laughs> Maybe want to shop and burn up What's that? You're okay. I'm okay, yeah. I didn't mean to throw in the ball. Well, this guy was so offended. I was like, man, I threw a snot in the ball. <laughs> You're a peg. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what do you want to know? Are you a fan of Steve-O? I don't know, too. This Steve-O? Yeah. He's a fucking jerk, Steve-O. Why do you say that? Why? Because yeah. he blew his fucking nose and put it on the, the platform over there. You fucking jerk. What do you think, Steve-O? He's a fucking jerk. <laughs> he blew his nose and wiped it all like this, like the old uh, DTW guys do. Right over here. Don't all tell right. me he didn't do it. I saw him do it. That's what I think of Steve-O. He's a friggin' embarrassment, this kid. Hey, dude, let's barge this roof gap, dude. What? Let's barge this roof gap. All right. Yeah. Don't do it. Uh, Don't do it. It's such a gimme. I was still in college the first time I did one of my pool dives. At first, it was like a second floor balcony. And then it was a third floor balcony. And then it was a roof. And then I just wanted to flip so bad. <laughs> I just figured like, I was having a lot of fun jumping off buildings, you know, and I always loved skateboarding. I remember being really impressed with all the divers at the Olympic pool at University of Miami, you know. So I dropped out of University of Miami and like, I was just inspired. I knew I wouldn't be like a diver. So I figured if I just dove off buildings, it, you know, it wouldn't matter that I wasn't all that skilled, <laughs> you know.
see right there that uh, that window that opens out? That's where I lived. I lived in this shitty little storage closet. I, I moved a shitty little mattress in there, and like I, I had like a you know, tiny little fridge and a fan, and I got locked out. So it's fucked. I had to climb off the roof, like underneath the window that opens out. I didn't really have a concept of the real world. I didn't exactly expect to succeed in the real world either. <laughs> On the patio right there, it was only set tiny was on his butt on fire. The rubbing alcohol in the Vaseline, the first ever rump roast on the patio. Triple as usual. Dude, what's going on over here? <laughs> we got Kevo. That's right, Steve-O taught me how to party, bro. <laughs> we fucking dominated all over the place. Wait, uh, like, uh, I jumped out in 93. Yeah, and you slept yeah. in my apartment with Chuck when we were swinging grass from LJ <laughs> to pay for our rent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was there when he broke his face. You actually had heard the... Splat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's on one of these balconies where I broke my cheekbone and on my teeth. But uh, yeah, it was pretty rad when he when he broke out and showed up the next day, beer in hand in his in his little gown. I was so drunk I couldn't even say my name right. And in the morning, I mean, I was fucked. And like the first thing I did was hop up and break out of the hospital. I didn't know what the hell to do. Well, you, you filmed my face. I like all fucked up. Yeah, I filmed his face in my mother's driveway. Yeah, dude, it's already recording, dude. Oh yeah. Yeah, dude. Does it say record? It says e record. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so I'm just getting my... I should get my stitches on there. These are my CAT scans from when I broke my skull. I had a, a broken cheekbone, seven broken teeth, ten stitches in my chin, and a broken wrist. I was always been so proud of my CAT scans. Basically, Steve-O was a nuisance that everyone loved. He was struggling, and we all loved him, and we all tried to take care of him. But, you know, at certain times, it just became burdensome, because he was such a piece of shit. Hey, dude, I'm going to go first. But you pick your spot, bro. All right. <laughs> oh. Aquaduker. Oh, yeah, the Aquaduker. <laughs> Hey, dude, don't stick your ass in the air anymore. <laughs> oh, yes! Let me zoom in on that, baby. The Aqua Duke in the Loxahatchee River, I think we're responsible for its decline. <laughs> um, Kevin filmed that big log flying out of my plane. Yeah, big log, the Aqua Duke was pretty sweet. It's probably, I'm sure it's still floating out there somewhere. Like I said, that whole nuisance factor, you know, you keep trying and keep trying and keep trying, you know, you just won't go away. Yeah, I mean, I had a good feeling that there was some stunt work in the future. I, I didn't think that it would be quite as crazy and rad. Well, I remember we had a conversation uh, when he was struggling in his freshman year and uh, said he wanted to be a stunt man. <laughs> we just laughed. So that's just about the most ridiculous thing we'd ever heard. But I guess with 2020 hindsight, that's exactly what happened. You can tell a distinct difference between the footage like from the you know, early days in Miami to when I moved to Albuquerque. As soon as I moved out to Albuquerque, I met up with Ryan Simonetti. From the first moment I met Steve, I knew he was definitely going to do something rad with his life. I wasn't quite sure where he was going to go with it, but he had so much enthusiasm, I knew he was on his way. I walked into a skate park in Albuquerque, right around the park, and I was like, yeah, you know, like all badass. Hey, I'm this videotape, check this out, dude. Like, 
he watched it and he was like, man, that's pretty wild. Like, like right away, like uh, I jumped in Ryan's car and he took me around to buildings he thought I could jump up. All of a sudden, like we just meant business. First days I, I ever met Ryan Simon Eddie, we started lighting my head on fire. You know, like we, we came up with so many ways of lighting on fire, it was ridiculous. And uh, I did handstands a lot of the time, so I told him like, yeah, hey man, like when you get on your car and drive down the road, I want to do a handstand on the roof. You know, it's just the way that Simon Eddie and I work, man. Like he's like, all right, dude, let's do it. Even just the stupid trick where like you go up and do a handstand and put the skateboard on your feet and you balance it on your feet while you walk with your hands, like. That took me years and years of work to do. And I would get it up there and I'd drop it and it would spike my finger and, you know, I'd just get so hurt. And um, I knew that I had to learn it because Ryan and I had this plan where I'm gonna walk down the stairs and then he's gonna jump over me. We had the idea for literally like two years before, you know, all of our work paid off and, you know, I was able to get that freaking board on my feet and land it. But yeah, that first time when we pulled it off, you can just see in the footage, like, we're just so, like, oh, so much work went into it, and we're just so, like, yeah, just hugging each other, like, oh, yeah, we finally got that done. All right. Do it, Steve-o. One night while we were partying, we decided that the next day during Steve's lunch break, I'd go pick him up and take him back to my apartment so he could do this roof dive. It was three stories in the four feet of water. Ridiculous. So yeah, I had, like, an hour, like, a one-hour break from my work. You know, reshelving videos at the video store. And Simon Eddie came and picked me up right when my break started, drove me down to his apartment building where uh, I was on that roof for like 20 minutes. And then finally, like, finally I just, you know, did the flip off the roof and we were all so psyched. Yeah! <laughs> yeah, Steve O! Yeah! yeah. And, uh, Jumped back in the car and drove me back to work, like right, right in the nigga time. And I was just still wet at work. And like, it's like, yeah, you know, showing the camera to people, like, look what I just did, man. I'm gonna be huge. <laughs> <You know? laughs> hey, that was like 1996. And like, I used to just reshow videos. And I was just saying, like, man, I should be fucking, you know, I should be a performer. Like, you know, that was before Clown College, before everything. I attended Ringling Brothers Barnum Clown College, which is technically harder to get into than Harvard, statistically speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I was living in Albuquerque with my sister, and she worked uh, as a newspaper reporter. And she was at work taking a crap, and this book of trivia she was reading said, what's the only college that has no tuition? And she flipped to the answer and it said, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Clown College. Um, you know, it's so exclusive to get in, like if you can get in, it's free. So she immediately thought of me, because I was kind of, you know, a waste. So I called up and I wound up hitchhiking to Denver to go audition for it. They had 60 of us against a wall. They said, jump in front of the camera, say what your name is and why you want to be a clown. And uh, I jumped in front of the camera and I said, my name's Steve Glover, I'm an aspiring a stuntman from Al Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I just hitchhiked here from Albuquerque because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life thinking I would have blown the biggest opportunity I ever had. Then I did a perfect backflip and, you know, got it. So I made my impression at the audition for sure. Off I went to Clown College. train for like 14 hours every day at least at the end of the day we had a sort of a rehearsal 
kind of free time to work on whatever we wanted. And I spent the entire time working on the rollerbola. Yeah, I mean, at the time, it was the craziest idea I could have been. Like, wow, what if I jumped on a rollerbola, on a skateboard on a rollerbola? And the only person probably that was kind of into it was our Hungarian acrobatics instructor, Janos. He's trying to help me pull off my stunt, so he's just talking to me in Hungarian. And don't do the legs, because if you go to the legs, akkor sokkal több utat kell megtenni a lábodnak, és több időbe telik, és nagyon valószínű, hogy bele fog akadni. No way I would ever understand a word you're saying. As it, as it happened, he coached me to do it in Hungarian. <laughs> so yeah, that was awesome. I think it's safe to say that I didn't act any much differently when I was in clown college than I do now. I'm bags, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I need roller skates. <laughs> I want to bust a gainer flip down a flight of stairs on roller skates. It's one fucking crazy dude. <laughs> crazy. Genetic. I didn't really learn all that much, but having the name Ringling Brothers to brag about sure helps open some doors for me. It wasn't going to clown college that really gave me like my big break. It was like burning my face off for Big Brother magazine. That's what really like gave me my break. Larry Flint publishes like 20 some odd porno magazines and one skateboard magazine. Big Brother. So Big Brother comes into Albuquerque on tour with a bunch of pro skaters and Steve's at the point in his life where he's trying to get like a lot of recognition for doing stunts so he can get into magazines and stuff. Yeah, I heard the Duff's tour was coming through. I tracked their asses down. I literally, like, the Big Brother didn't know me. Like, I showed up telling them, like, whether you like it or not, you're gonna publish me because what I'm gonna do tonight's gonna be crazy. At a house party, a backyard kegger, he, uh, he gets my attention with his little fireball trick backflip thing where he ended up burning his face off. And of course, I had to write an article about that because idiots are what make Big Brother, work. You know, there's Chris Markovich there, favorite skater. He wanted him to blow it for him, and he's never done it before, so he fucked up the first time, of course, and blew all the fluid all over steve -O's face. So now his face is soaked with alcohol. His whole hair caught on fire, his face caught on fire. But Steve proceeded to uh, finish the trick after burning his face off. I burned my face off, dude. You gotta, you gotta go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah, 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 we do. You alright? Your hair is fried. Yeah, your hair is gone. My face is gone. Oh, Steve! You right? Nah, no, not even. Steve, fill my face. See, I'm fine. Steve burned his face so bad he ended up looking like Freddy Krueger. It's horrible. That's the first time that the world, the skate community, knew about Steve. -O. Still, the next time Big Brother came through Albuquerque, I had to kind of track him down. But uh, soon enough, they were calling me to let me know like when our paths would cross. And you know, I just had a good relationship with Big Brother. First time I met Steve-O was on the Big Brother Florida trip. And uh, we went straight to his house. We're all excited to meet him. I've seen all this footage of him. And he'd pretty much been calling me every day before it. And this butt nut just starts going crazy. Blah, 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 I want to do this, blah, blah, blah. Does a backflip fireball, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm pretty psyched. But just after about 20 minutes, I just had to get the fuck away from this guy. So we jumped in the van and we tried to ditch him. But uh, he wasn't going to let that happen. He knew that he was going to get on the video. And uh, pretty much from then on, We've had gold with Mr. O. So it was simultaneous the whole time. Like, I was submitting stuff for Big Brothers, you know, the magazine and the videos, like, while I was doing this clown thing. Over there. I probably would have graduated from from university if I didn't get offered a job on cruise ships. 
And after Clown Call just finished, like I didn't get offered a contract to work in the circus. So I went back to Albuquerque, and uh, the only thing I really did for money was sell pot. And I lived with uh, my skateboard buddies in this dirty, dirty house, the same house where we threw the girl through the beer cans. I like, dubbed together tapes of all the stunts I have, and I sent tapes to the circus. And so like uh, a bunch of clowns left the circus when they got the cruise ship gig. And they were just thinking, who can we get, you know? And they remembered seeing my video. And so like, uh, they tracked me down and offered me the cool job on cruise ships. Working on cruise ships is not even work. Which cruise ship line was it? Uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Even though I'm sure that they don't, they're not looking for a plug in my video. I was called an interactive performer. Our job was to perform in the, this like 1,500 seat theater, and other than that, we would. Our job was to like just sort of roam around the cruise ship and freak people out with these characters that we would become. One of my characters was the security guard. I'd yell, yell at them for running, you know, when they weren't even running, you know. Hey, you want to slow down their speed? <laughs> you know, this is no running zone. <laughs> I just hassle people. It's funny, I used to literally get paid to roam around a cruise ship just pissing people off. <laughs> yeah. Like, definitely more of the people, like, didn't like me than liked me. <laughs> My friend, I see those to see you. Hey, Evo, Evo, come on down, man. I got nothing. Oh. 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 They fucking got me fired from that fucking cruise ship, those other clowns. They went to, like, the... You know, the important cruise ship people, and they were like, if, if Steve-O comes back for another contract, we're not coming, you know? I didn't know they had some kind of problem with me. <laughs> While I worked on cruise ships, I was just amazed by the idea of stabling myself. The Thousand Dollar Man was my first ever stable ad. <laughs> yeah, the Thousand Dollar Man. <laughs> and I don't know what I thought was more amazing, stabling myself or having a thousand dollars. I was ready to get off cruise ships when the contract was over. Fuck those clowns for firing me. <laughs> Steve started drinking when he was like two or three. And uh, the first time I ever remember my brother being completely and totally wasted, he was like four. It was never really about like having skills like or showing talent. It was more just about how wasted and crazy can I get. <laughs> Like, we would film getting wasted, like, the time when we went to go see if we could get the dude at the gas station to drink with us behind the counter. <laughs> that was rad. Dude, party! Sweet! Yeah, party! Back again, buddy! Party! Hey, bro! Came out to drink a little brew with you, bud. We're making a documentary, dude. You got a documentary? We're having a party! Oh, we have the in the. Oh, okay. Oh my god. Cheers, what? You get a good We're side view. We're making a movie about partying. Movie. We said, who can we get that knows how to party? We were like, my buddy, cross the street, you fucking party! Bum fishing went down in like early 1998. I'm psyched on that because it, like way before Jackass started, like we were definitely out there just to film like anything just that we thought was funny. Freaking people out in the street, like is always funny, especially when you have a dollar on a damn fishing line <laughs> and you're bum fishing. <laughs> yeah.
It was after cruise ships and before I joined the circus that uh, I went out to California to meet Knoxville and film that stilt stunt for the pilot. He was already like a big cult hero from skate videos, you know? And I'd been in videos with him, but never met him. I mean, it was cool, we met up and set my ass on fire and that was it. My first impression of Steve-O is you want to choke the living hell out of him when you meet him. He's like, ah, dude, check me out, check me out, dude. I didn't hate him as bad as Pontius did at first, but I, I, I wasn't nuts about him. But then, man, he grows on you like a fungus, and now, like, I love him more than anybody. When I first met Steve-O, I hated him. I seriously could not stand him. I didn't really care if he lived or died. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> But now I love him. I mean, he's famous. Yeah, it was after I got there that, that they told me, like, hey, you know, like, we're doing this for a pilot for MTV, and don't even worry about it. Like, it's definitely going to get picked up because we have Spike Jones' name on it. So I was like, oh, OK, that's cool. So we planned out my big stilt stunt where I was on fire with the unicyclist and Sam Nitty. But we planned it for uh, New Year's Eve 2000. And it was just really important to me for, uh, like Y2K, everybody's making a big deal out of it. Then on New Year's Eve of 1999, I was gonna do just a huge earth-shattering stunt. And part of my job on cruise ships was to walk, walk around on stilts. So rather than just fall down on stilts, I figured I would have my stilt costume on fire with a unicyclist riding through my flaming stilts and sat ready all the way off a house over my head through a huge fireball that I blew out of my mouth. The stilt stunt took several tries because it was really hard getting his stilt pants to burn. At the same time, I was going over the top of him off the roof and the unicyclist was going between his legs. But the third one, I, yeah, the third one was a huge success. And then later, everybody found out that we weren't allowed to play with fire on TV. So yeah, that one slipped through the cracks. Only now does the world get to see it. I guess the thing I, I, I'm proudest of in terms of the uh, involvement I've had with Steve is alerting him to uh, a couple of contracts, including the MTV contract, where the uh, lawyers buried uh, in the fine print a lot of very restrictive language that would pre have prevented him from doing his own videos or his own road shows. They were out to screw him, and I did the best I could to prevent that from happening. Yeah. <laughs> you don't mess with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I was just kind of waiting for, you know, the pilot to get picked up and just sort of biding my time in the circus. So we're here in the Fort Lauderdale Swap Shop, the home of the Hannaford Family Circus, where old Steve-O performed as a circus clown for six months. As clowns go, I wasn't funny and I wasn't terribly talented, you know, but I showed up on time and I did my, I did my shows. This is George Hannaford III. Hi. A world-class circus performer. He was a decent clown. He, he always showed up on time. He always, he, he was clean. He always had his makeup on and uh, he had a real good makeup. He had a real good, uh, he looked like a, a good clown. He wasn't like one of those scary kind of uh, clowns that uh, scare kids instead of entertain them. He, he, was a, he was a good looking clown. He would do pretty much the same stunts that he does on stage now. He would do in the circus ring. He would balance the ladders on his head. He would uh, blow the flames out. He hasn't changed one bit from what I, every time I see him on like Stern or anything, that's exactly how he was right from day one. He was always like, had big plans. He always was like looking towards the future. When I worked on cruise ships, I was floating at sea, you know, and I like, I couldn't really like do anything. But here it's like, the circus doesn't travel. I go to work, you know, and like, as soon as I, as soon as I left the circus every day, I was no longer Steve-O the Clown. I was like Steve-O. Like, I was able to like pursue my 
build a career more and just kind of earn my money in the circuit. He didn't just, he wasn't just satisfied with the status quo. He wasn't just going to be a circus clown. He took his performance seriously. You think he's goofing around, but he's, deep down, he's serious about performing. So really, I spent the entire time in the circus in Florida um, just waiting for the jackass pilot to get picked up. And my last circus performance, um, I w watched out for my clown makeup, and within probably half an hour, I was picking up a goldfish. You know, and there, once that goldfish segment aired once on MTV, literally the next day, my life was forever changed. I'm proud of the success he's achieved. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, I don't think any parent would choose this as the uh, optimal career for any one of their kids. And I certainly tried very hard to talk him out of it. But now that he's committed and it's his life and he's got to make those calls for himself, uh, I'd rather have him be successful than unsuccessful. And uh, I think most recently he's done a pretty good job of being successful. I went from clown college to selling pot, yeah. from selling pot to working on cruise ships, and from working on cruise ships to being in the circus. But in between cruise ships and the circus was when I filmed the stilt stunt for the Jackass pilot. Right when it did get picked up, when I got that first phone call from Tremaine, say, hey, it's not a pilot anymore, man. Like, you know, we got ordered. He told me to send in, like, he knew I had a lot of footage, so he told me to pack up all the footage I had that would be good for the show, you know, and send it all in so that they can acquire it. So I packed up every last piece of footage I had and I sent it in, and not one goddamn clip was allowed on TV. So, I mean, I like from, from the inception of the TV show, I was sitting on like a gold mine of footage that wasn't going to be allowed to play. So, from day one, I was, you know, working on my sort of not allowed on TV product. <laughs> I'm having fun doing it too. Like, they're going to keep coming. <laughs> the, the, the world is full of uh, low IQ people that try to look intelligent and fall on their ass. And Steve, I think, is a fairly high IQ person that does a great job of looking stupid. And that's probably why he's successful at what he does. <laughs> yeah. People find out I'm smart. Go, Thank you. <laughs> I've got a special spot in the pit of my stomach reserved for worrying about my brother. But we have a deal. I mean, I uh, prefer hearing about the stunts after he's already survived them. Yeah, as long as he doesn't drive anything that causes permanent damage. Hopefully the less I know on that front, the better. This was an H Road production. Later. <laughs> See ya.